For all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. In fact, according to our model, we believe that the scripture talks about we living in a fallen world. And the evidence appears to show and indicate that we live in a world that has been degenerated from creation. Oh, yeah. um, well, if we see rapid decay in our genomes due to mutations, is this what we're really seeing? And is this, um, this seems to all go back to the concept of genetic entropy, kind of uh, Sanford's model, right? So Dr. Carter, what is the genetic entropy exactly? And what are some of the best lines of evidence supporting it? Genetic entropy is the idea that if most mutations are weak, natural selection can't see them. In order for natural selection to operate, a variation has to affect reproduction. Either you die young or you don't have as many children or whatever it is, it's something that affects how many children you have. If most mutations, like, I mean, you and I and everyone listening were born with about a hundred mutations that our parents didn't have when they were born. And I don't feel like a mutant, but I have a hundred new spelling errors in my genome. And those mutations, I might have a broken gene. I might have a defect of something else. I might have some rearrangement somewhere. They're just, I mean, if you had like, a, if you had a textbook for biology class and it was handwritten, I would expect to find a few mutations in that textbook. But let's say that at the end of every year, the student has to hand in for his final project, a handwritten copy of his textbook and the original is destroyed. And then the next year's class, they're handed the textbooks that were copied the year before. And every year a new copy is made, a new copy is made, a new, eventually no one will be able to pass biology class right. because there'll be so many mistakes in the books. It'll be, it'll be totally worthless. And that's an analogy of what's happening in the genome. If we are picking up mutations every generation, that means we're going downhill and eventually we will have to go extinct mathematically that's so good no i was gonna say yeah that's an awesome answer so essentially dr carter we're more mutant today than we've ever been and even on a population level if you were to let's say get rid of the worst of the worst you're still left with people who are more mutant than the generation before it yep yeah, very simple it's, it's, now it we've seen this um massive computer models uh there's a, a program written called mendel's accountant that was written by Sanford and uh, several computer scientists. It was designed specifically to test ideas of evolution and genetic entropy using nothing but evolutionary assumptions. It's really interesting that the most comprehensive evolutionary modeling program was written by creationists. Right, right. And they went out on a limb because they might have been wrong. Right. And it seems like um, the criticisms that I've read, I guess, in blogs is typically where you find it. It, it. it almost appears like they have no understanding of the program to begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And they almost never understand that this objection they raise was systematically analyzed and published. Right, right. So truncation selection, synergistic ep epistasis, all these things they might throw at these big words they try to throw <laughs> at you. Wait, wait. Oh, that was in this article right here. Oh, you're not going to read it, are you? No. Yeah, right. I, I find that um, in, in my own experience where a, uh, a criticism is brought up and, and I'll send them a, a technical paper that, that's been published that explains the data and then I never hear from them again. So like you said, I, I don't think they're even uh, reading it. But the greatest place to see genetic entropy, actually there's two. One's in the human genome. If you look at the you know, seven and a half billion people in the world today, essentially every single possible mutation has happened in the human genome millions of times 
only in this generation. Mm. If every person is born with 200-ish mutations, there's seven and a half billion people. There's only three billion letters in the genome. Wow. <laughs> when, when you think of it that way, it's it's a I, for us our, our hope is in Christ. So you know it's 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 yeah. not a scary thing essentially because our hope is in heaven. But for the unbeliever, you know that can be a, a daunting fact to accept. Yeah. So they just generally just dismiss it without considering because to consider right. it means a lot. There's a lot of implications behind it. I mean that means that we, we're a ticking time bomb. Our species. There's a limit how long we can live. Which makes right. sense universally. I mean, second right. law of thermodynamics applies to everything. It applies to information also. It's not just about molecules in a dish. It applies to all systems. All systems, errors accumulate over time. And that's what we're seeing in the genome. Right, right. Awesome points. Well, um, Dr. Carter, I've seen critics of the genetic entropy model. I've seen them. This is a common one. Um, and, and this was also brought up in Paul Price's debate, and Paul Price did a phenomenal job. They'll say that Kimura has been misrepresented, and apparently beneficial mutations should be able to counterbalance the damage done by deleterious mutation mm -hmm. accumulation. What would be the best way to counter such a, a criticism? Um, that, again, has been thoroughly analyzed using Mandel's accountant. Right. So using nothing but, you know, Kimura's model and, and neutral evolution, they, you can put in whatever mutation spectrum you want. How many positive mutations would you like? How many negative mutations would you like? How strong are they? What's your distribution of mutations? Are most of them nearly neutral or some, are most of them really bad or really good? Put in whatever distribution you want, put it into your model, run it over time. And if you have some super beneficial good mutation, Yes, it will amplify itself in the genome while you're going extinct. Because wow. if you're selecting for that particular variant, like maybe it makes you 10 feet tall and, you know, as strong, strong as Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're super smart <laughs> and, you know, everything all together. It just, it maybe it doubles the amount of children that you have. Well, if that's being selected that strongly, that means that everything in the region around it is also being selected and it's carried along with it. All these bad mutations that are accumulating are carried along with that good mutation. Right. And you have a dramatic loss of diversity in that area because all the other variants are not being uh, amplified, only that one at the expense of everything else. And so what happens is you have fixation of that good mutation and fixation of all the bad mutations along with it. Got it. So there's no calorie balance at all. Got it. No. In fact, I just read a paper last week, two weeks ago, and they said that most of the human genome is under purifying selection, meaning that even if most of that material really isn't very functional, the functional areas are carrying along all the non-functional stuff with it. Right. Boom. That's exactly the idea. So yeah, you can select for blue eyes or, or lactose tolerance or sickle cell anemia, but that means that everything in that neighborhood in the genome is also being selected. Right. Yeah. So the evolutionists have to address the key issue, which would be net gain versus net loss. And although by the sounds of it, you can increase fitness occasionally in a, in a very narrow sense, sure. but the entirety of the genome is still degenerating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, example of fitness gain would be um, the increase in sickle cell anemia in Central Africa. The sickle cell is debilitating debilitating uh, disease. It's a terrible disease. It hurts. It kills people. But if your red blood cells have the ability to crystallize, if the hemoglobin has the ability to crystallize inside your blood, that tears apart the malaria parasites that live inside the red blood cells. So it's better to have the sickle cell trait in the presence of malaria than to be dead. Right, right. So there's a very strong selective pressure and yet it's selecting for something that's bad. And we see that all over the place. There's so many broken things in the genome that are selectable. Tons of them. Right. So, so it sounds like even though beneficial mutations are rare, when you do get a beneficial mutation like sickle cell anemia, for example, that has a significant impact, overall it's due to something broken and it's still reductive in some way. Yeah, almost all so-called beneficial mutations are reductive. In fact, they're not beneficial, except in a very specific context. Right. 
like you know the, the blind cave fish. Why would you want to lo lose an eyeball? Didn't it take you a half a billion years to evolve that eyeball in the first place? <laughs> Right. Well, in a cave where there's no light, you don't want an eyeball. You get a scrape, you get a fungal infection, you're dead. If you don't have any eyeballs, that the most sensitive part of your body is not present. Okay, so that's a strongly selectable trait in a dark environment, but it's totally going the wrong direction. And that's what we see. Almost every case of a strongly selectable trait is something going backwards. Well, what's funny, it seems like the evidence is clear. Everything you're saying is, is, is amazing confirmation evidence of a world that was once perfect and now has descended into degeneration, death, extinction.